Well, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to Defenders Lunch and Learn webinar. My name is Tracy Davids and I'm the Southeast Program Coordinator based in Asheville, North Carolina. I help to lead outreach efforts for our field team of which this Lunch and Learn series is a part. And I'm delighted to be your host today. If you have any questions along the way or any comments, please put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them as we go. Um, we like interaction, we like to hear from you. So feel free to put comments in there, um, use it as you'd like. Lunch and Learn, if you haven't been to these before, uh, this is an educational series that's offered by the Defenders Southeast Field Team to bring our membership a little bit closer to the work that we're doing on the ground and to let you know how you can help and get engaged. And today we're gonna to be talking about a project we've been working on for about five years now um, to provide safe passage for wildlife across Interstate 40, bordering the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, and this happens to be National Park Week. So we're celebrating our national parks um, the Smokies is one of the best. It is the most heavily visited park in the United States. So we have a gem here. Um, and joining me today are two colleagues, Ben Prater. He is the Southeast Program Director based in Asheville who leads our field program um, and manages staff, leads the field program. Uh, he's our bus driver. And Dr. Liz Hilliard, she's the senior wildlife biologist from Wildlands Network, and she's also based in Asheville. So we plan to present for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open the floor up for any questions, comments, or feedback that you have. But first, I want to do a, just a little, um, little intro to Defenders of Wildlife for those of you who might be new, or as a refresher for some of our longer term members. So our mission is to protect all native animals and plants in their natural communities. And we do this by working on the ground, in the courts, and on Capitol Hill to protect and restore imperiled wildlife across the continent. And our work on the ground is the focus of our field conservation program. We have six field offices across the country in Alaska, the Pacific Northwest, California, Rockies and Plains, the Southwest, and here in the Southeast. And there's a really good reason that we work here in the Southeast. And that's because we have mega biological diversity and with very few protected areas and a growing human population, this biodiversity faces many threats. Within our region, we have five key landscapes on which we focus, and those are circled. The first one is the Southern Appalachians. It's a global hotspot for freshwater fish and amphibians. Next is the Carolina coast, and that's home to the endangered red wolf. Then there's the greater Everglades, home to Florida panthers, manatees, and many other species. And of course, the Florida Panhandle, home to gopher tortoises and sea turtles along the coast. And then finally, the Gulf Coast, home to biodiversity hotspots like the Mobile Tensaw River Delta and the Gulf of Mexico whale. And so today, we're going to be focusing on this area right here. So this dark green patch is the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The Pivot Pigeon River Gorge, where I-40 is located, runs um, along here and goes between, uh, connects Tennessee and Western North Carolina together. So that's where we're gonna focus. So I'm curious to know how many of you are familiar with this area. Um, so I'm gonna launch a poll to find out and answers are anonymous. So go ahead and fill in the poll. Um, the first question is, have you ever traveled along I-40 through the Pigeon River Gorge between North Carolina and Tennessee? And the second question is, have you ever visited the Great Smoky Mountains National Park? And I'll give you a couple of moments to answer. 
great. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And it uh, looks like a few of you have been along the Pigeon River Gorge. And um, more than half of you have visited the Smokies. Great. So you have a little, a little sense of what we're talking about here. Um, so those of you who have visited the area <clears throat> and know its wild character might be happy to learn that a safe passage for wildlife is currently being created at exit seven on I-40, adjacent to the Harmon Den Bear Sanctuary as part of a North Carolina Department of Transportation bridge repair project. And this is the location right here. This is the bridge. <clears throat> and this is where the uh, repairs are actually happening and the wildlife crossings are being installed. So we're excited about this because it's a solution to address a growing problem that all of us witness every day on our major highways. And that's wildlife mortality caused by vehicle collisions. If you've ever struck an animal, you know just how awful this is for you and the animal. Um, in addition to killing one to two million animals every year in the US, approximately 200 people die as a result of these collisions. Additionally, these collisions cause more than 26,000 injuries nationwide. And it turns out that these collisions have a pretty big economic impact as well. Um, does anybody want to guess at the annual price tag resulting from wildlife vehicle collisions in the U.S. annually? It's pretty staggering. It's $12 billion. <clears throat> and these numbers are expected to rise as our population continues to grow and a warming climate and habitat loss move wildlife into new territories in search of food and mates. And that's because animals have been doing this for centuries and their instinct is to continue moving across age old geographical paths. But people have made this natural migration more difficult by fragmenting large natural areas, bisecting them with huge roads full of heavy fast moving vehicles. And even in wild and rugged places, animals are going to encounter major roads to cross, like this mama bear and her three cubs crossing I-40 uh, in the Pigeon River Gorge near the North Carolina-Tennessee border. Come on, baby. Those are some lucky bears. <clears throat> Folks gave them the opportunity to pass, but that's not always the case. The good news though, is that all of this is preventable, right? We have the ability to create ways for wildlife and people to travel safely along I-40 with crossing infrastructure, like we've done in Florida, um, out west, and in other parts of the world, like um, Canada, this is uh, the bottom picture is not Florida, that is Banff uh, National Park in Canada, and the other two are um, wildlife crossings in Florida. So Safe Passage, the I-40 Pigeon River Gorge Wildlife Crossing Project was created to do just that. Uh, we are a coalition of about 20 local, state, tribal, and federal agencies land managers, nonprofit organization, uh, nonprofit park partners, and other community members who believe it's possible to balance the needs of native wildlife and the ever-growing human population in Western North Carolina and East Tennessee. Uh, partner members of this coalition <clears throat> include Wildlands Network, the Conservation Fund, North Carolina Wildlife Federation, Great Smoky Mountains, uh, Great Smoky Mountains Association, National Parks Conservation Association, and of course, Defenders. <clears throat> we are finding collaborative solutions for safe wildlife passage across I-40 and other areas, 
in order to reduce collisions, improve land connectivity for wildlife, and increase public awareness and safe driving conditions. So when the North Carolina Department of, Edu uh, <laughs> Department of Education, right, when the North Carolina Department of Transportation announced its plans to replace the Harmon Den Bridge on I-40, our coalition collaborated with the agency to develop a safe solution to fit this particular site. Aligning our objectives with agencies like this is a really powerful, powerful tool and underscores the positive impact that we can have when we work together. So Ben, you have worked as a scientist and wildlife conservationist in Western North Carolina and throughout the Southeast for about 20 years now. Why is this area special and in need of this project? Absolutely. Well, if you can go ahead and advance to the next slide, it'll show um, a general map of the area. As Tracy's pointed out, and thank you for doing so, Tracy, this interstate uh, through the Pitcher River Gorge really does bisect and create a barrier effect through some of the most rugged and wild landscapes. Uh, these are real strongholds in Western North Carolina for wildlife. Uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, of course, is one of our most visited national parks. Um, it's visited primarily to view and enjoy wildlife, including um, the first reestablished population of elk in the region. Uh, it has one of the densest populations of black bear uh, in the entire country. And this is um, a unique area of terrain where the National Park and the Pisgah National Forest actually connect. Uh, and from a wildlife perspective, this creates a significant robust landscape scale corridor uh, moving east to west that wildlife use quite frequently. And so the Pitcher River Gorge is really sort of that hot spot where we see these conflict with wildlife crossings uh, through this rugged landscape. Um, and it's also ripe for our engagement because just in the last 16 years, there's been a 43% increase in traffic volume along the interstate in this area. Um, and more than 26,000 vehicles pass through this 28 mile stretch of highway each and every day. Um, and it's getting worse because as Tracy pointed out, we have an increasing human population. Uh, folks are moving to uh, these places in droves to, uh, they're coming to enjoy and be close to these beautiful places. Um, and for that reason, we also see a growing and, and thriving tourism industry, which attracts more people. Um, and also, as we pointed out earlier, in a, an age of climate change, we are expecting um, uh, continued and increased movements of species through these areas as they're looking for better refuge, uh, better habitat, uh, food, shelter, and mates. And so we know there will soon be an even higher concentration of critters migrating through the uh, southeastern part of the continent and through the Appalachians. Um, and really, primarily, one of the goals at Defenders is ensuring that our public lands remain interconnected and permeable uh, to protect all the unique wildlife values. And again, the, the park uh, is one of those real crown jewels of that landscape. It's visited by more than 12 and a half million people each year. Um, and habitat destruction and fragmentation in and around the park are particularly threatening for far dispersing species like black bear and elk that seasonally move and migrate for breeding and foraging opportunities uh, outside park boundaries. You know, we, we often quip that, uh, that, you know, animals don't read maps and that's very true. You know, as long as these landscapes and habitats are connected, the animals move freely through those. And what do they discover and find along that path? These very deadly highways. So reducing mortality and lessening this barrier effect uh, in the I-40 corridor is paramount to increasing that slate, safe flow of animals of a full range and suite of species um, uh, into and out of the national park and adjacent public lands. And speaking of those species, here is just a quick sample of some of the various uh, remarkable animals that uh, utilize this corridor regularly. We've mentioned, of course, black bear and elk. There's also a suite of reptiles and amphibians, even aquatic species, you know, as creeks cross this area, you know, fish, uh, salamanders, aquatic insects all need that connectivity as well. 
Uh, we also see birds of prey using the interstate. Oftentimes you'll notice that these animals also suffer from vehicle strikes because they're attracted to these places uh, because their prey come into these uh, habitats. Uh, it's why it's so important that we never uh, litter, of course, but even biodegradable things like an apple core or banana peel should stay in your car so they don't attract rodents, which then attract um, uh, birds of prey. There's also a, a full range of meso, meso predators and carnivores, included spotted skunks, long-tailed weasels, bobcats, gray and red fox, and coyotes all move through this area as well. And we'll move to the next slide. Um, and safe passage, again, is not just for wildlife. You know, as we've indicated in some of the numbers earlier, they benefit people too. Um, collisions with larger animals, black bear and elk, can result in multiple vehicle accidents, causing serious human injury, as well as economic impacts, uh, both for medical cost, insurance cost, and property damage. Uh, on average, colliding with a deer can cost upwards of $6,000. And running into an elk can cost upwards of $17,000, if not someone's health, life, and safety. And if animal populations decline due to these collisions, this could also impact the environment and economy on a much larger scale, decreasing opportunities for wildlife viewing, hunting, and fishing uh, for visitors and residents alike. So the first step to really mitigate this issue is gaining an understanding of how these animals navigate the landscape. Where do they go? When? Why? Um, and so with support from multiple stakeholders and partner organizations, um, the National Parks Conservation Association and Wildlands Network work together to do a really comprehensive and robust research project to look at wildlife movement patterns in this specific landscape, focusing on black bear, elk, and white-tailed deer uh, and they've been monitoring other species as well. They're both using tr uh, traffic collision data and wildlife cameras, also GPS collars to determine where and how humans uh, can help make changes to best uh, help these animals move across the highway. Uh, essentially getting us to understanding where we can focus our energy and effort to provide safe passage. So today, Dr. Liz Hilliard, again with Wildlands Network, um, has been one of the principal researchers in partnership with NPCA. And so she's here to tell you a bit more about her findings. We're really excited. This, we're sort of on the, the end of a three-year study and have some great findings to share. Um, and I think before we do that, um, Tracy, are we going to launch one more poll question? Okay, perhaps oh. not. I'm sorry, go ahead. We're going to wait to the end. Got it. Okay. Uh, well, Liz, welcome. So glad to have you. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. There we go. Thanks, Ben and Tracy, for the great setup. So um, you guys have really laid down a good foundation. And um, hi, everyone out there. I'm excited to talk about the research portion of our collaborative effort to provide safe passage for wildlife just outside of Great Smoky Mountain National Park. So this area that we call the Pigeon River Gorge. And so um, just kind of giving, uh, you know, Ben put out this map prior, but just wanting to orient everyone. So our research is really focused on um, this 28 mile section of Interstate 40. So 20 miles in North Carolina and, uh, and eight miles in Tennessee. And so as Ben mentioned, the busy interstate here impedes and likely blocks wildlife movement to and from uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park there in blue to uh, our large public national forest, both the uh, Pisgah uh, National Forest on the North Carolina side and Cherokee, North Carolina, uh, Cherokee National Forest on the Tennessee side. So again, uh, our research goal is to identify hotspots of wildlife vehicle collisions and animal activity to help guide uh, these mitigation efforts along this section of roadway. Uh, next slide. So the target species for our research uh, were bear, white-tailed deer, and elk. And while these are, of course, iconic species, as Ben mentioned, they also need these large areas to fulfill their ecological needs, like food, space, and mates. So we focused uh, on these species. Uh, they're also easier to detect in uh, wildlife monitoring, um, things like camera traps, and also when we're doing uh, road mortality surveys, 
Uh, so we're focusing on these animals and, and really the idea is uh, the hope that creating safe passage for these species will provide safe passage for smaller wildlife and, and bring awareness to connectivity issues for aquatic and wildlife uh, that don't necessarily get the, the focus they deserve. So just a little bit about these species specifically uh, in this area. We have a very robust uh, black bear population. Um, while many places along the roadway, you see more wildlife, uh, you see more white-tailed deer collisions, we see more black bear collisions in the gorge. Um, at one time, these population uh, black bear populations were low in the 80s, but, but due to there's a bear sanctuary in this area and some protections, um, the population is now large. Uh, local state biologists often call this area a bear's death zone. So another reason um, why we flagged this area to look into uh, farther were the number of bear mortalities in the area. They're, they're very tied to the acorn mast and crop in the area. And if there's often if there's a uh, acorn crop failure, we'll see bears move very large distances to find these food resources and that puts them in counter with more roads and we see higher mortality those years. And then uh, Ben also mentioned that elk were reintroduced in Great Smoky Mountain National Park in 2001 and 2002. It's a slow growing population at 250 now. Um, and these animals, though they'll make larger seasonal movements, they don't migrate typically like we think of elk out west. Um, and of course, vehicle collisions with elk uh, are severe. And then we're also focused on white-tailed deer. We have moderate population of white-tailed deer in the mountains, um, but again, they're, they're kind of the most abundant roadkill and, and human safety issue uh, that, we, uh, that occur throughout most of the Southeast. Next slide. Yeah. Hey, Liz, did yeah. you, are all of these photographs taken in the project mm. area? Yeah, they are. These were some of my favorites to represent uh, so unfortunately today I'm rolling out pretty fast our, our methods and what we've done in our research, but we have such an amazing, and I do try to share some here, um, just a bunch of photos from the cameras we have along the roadside. So here, here you do see a black bear from one of our cameras almost, almost waving at us. Um, a uh, cow elk with her young calf uh, moving uh, just adjacent to the roadway. Uh, and also, you know, a young a young mom and her uh, and her fawn there. So, just some fantastic photos we've gotten just from trying to detect detect wildlife. So, um, of course, anything we're plugging today, if you go to the Safe Passage website, there's all kinds of content out in there. So, if you guys are seeing some of these photos you like, uh, please follow the website and um, happy to share those. So, um, again. To understand animal activity and guide where road mitigation efforts uh, should be focused for improving wildlife safe passage and human safety in the gorge, uh, we have conducted research from 2018 to 2021 using a multifaceted research approach. So with assistance from the National Park Service and uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission biologists, we collared um, 13 elk with GPS radio collars to track their movements and determine where elk are both crossing uh, and interacting with the roadway. Uh, we did weekly driving mortality surveys to uh, monitor and identify locations where wildlife vehicle collisions are occurring. And we work closely with both the Tennessee and the North Carolina Departments of Transportation uh, with their maintenance folks to get more records and historic records on, on where these collisions are, are happening. Uh, we also use roadside cameras so we can do some comparisons and understand animal activity adjacent to the roadway. And we monitored wildlife activity um, at these current bridges and culverts uh, throughout the gorge. So there's 21 large bridges and culverts that might uh, be moving wildlife. So we monitored those to see if they might be assisting wildlife currently or if they could be modified to help wildlife uh, safely pass the roadway. Next. All right, and so already moving to findings. And so um, from our monitoring elk with GPS collars, uh, we found three of the 13 elk monitored against small populations. So this is a pretty good sample size. Um, three animals interacted 
with the interstate, this 28 mile section of interstate right outside the park. Uh, one of those animals leaves uh, every early spring, crosses the interstate, both at the Appalachian Trail, where Appalachian uh, hikers cross uh, the Appalachian Trail to move northeast. Uh, she crosses both at this bridge and also at road grade. We detected her crossing the road 107 times. So she will uh, leave the epicenter in, in Great Smoky Mountain National Park, have her calf on the other side, and then we caught her in those photos, uh, bringing her calf back. Again, great photos uh, on the website to, to see her and her calf. And then um, we had two other elk that really interacted with the road, but never crossed. You know, This might indicate some sort of a barrier effect. And so, um, and as you can also see, we have, though only these three animals really interacted with the roadway, we see it's, it's spread out. They don't actually overlap. So we have a lot of places for potential deer, uh, bear, and, but specifically elk issues. Um, again, those are severe collisions. We're also trying to grow and protect our local population while allowing them to also access the resources on both sides of the roadway. So this focus on elk being really important and we're flagging these locations um, for potential mitigation. Next slide. And then the wildlife vehicle collision information. We compiled that information. Uh, we broke the roadway down into 115, 400 meter segments. That's really so we can pinpoint areas that we should be focusing mitigation. And so what we found throughout the study area, most segments, the average there was about uh, two and a half to three wildlife vehicle collisions uh, from 2001 to uh, 2021. So that's kind of the average of what we're seeing. But then we found a, a range of uh, number of vehicle mortalities within these uh, segments between zero and nine. We identified these hot spots as segments that had between five and nine, you know, greater than 75 percentile of, of what we're seeing out there. We, we labeled those as being hot spots. And we found that those occurred in 22 road segments. And when we look at this at the larger landscape, that ends up happening in about 10 areas in this 28 mile section of road. And so we're gonna, this is where we wanna prioritize our mitigation efforts. Next slide. And so we also did some modeling to try and understand what, what environmental variables or characteristics along the roadway might be influencing where these vehicle collisions are occurring. So we, we brought in information like forest cover, um, things like topography, slope, the terrain ruggedness. And we saw how that looked at how that might be influencing where these occur on the landscape. And we did find two big findings for, for both all of our target species combined, their location, vehicle collision locations along the road, but also in just looking at bear and deer vehicle collisions, since their ecologies are different and they might be driven by different areas where they're trying to cross the road and getting hit. And we really found that all of our target species, that vehicle collisions uh, occurred closer to where we have current bridges and culverts. So, and we know that these areas are likely uh, the conducive areas for movement for wildlife. They tend to have more shallow slopes where we've put our roadways or where water is moving through the landscape. And we also found that uh, vehicle collisions are more likely for bear and deer where their preferred habitats exist. We know forest cover is important uh, for bear, black bear. So we see that where that exists and where these uh, bridges and culverts are, we see increased bear vehicle collisions. And we see that deer uh, in our mountains that often you know, are concentrated in the lower lying areas, uh, bottomland areas or open fields, we, we saw that they, where there wasn't a lot of ridge area, but where areas were closer to culverts and bridges, we saw increased uh, deer vehicle uh, collisions. Next slide. And so if this finding shows us that, you know, we're seeing these vehicle collisions are more concentrated near these bridges and culverts, but we know that bridges and culverts, how they currently exist, 
to move vehicles or water. Also, dew percent opportunities and are all and are used in other landscapes for wildlife to move safely under or over um, the roadway. And, and so some of the best photos we have here from monitoring some of the structures I mentioned, these 21 different structures, a diversity of structures, bridges for vehicles to move under, um, small culverts, but also these metal culverts to move water. And uh, next slide, sorry to block these fun photos, but just to get at the information. So as you can see here, we do have wildlife uh, there are opportunities where they are using these, but those are few and far between. So here are our structures monitored. As you see on the, on the x-axis there, that's 20 different events. So we, we counted the number of successful crossing events by wildlife. That's them, a bear, deer, and elk going in or, and then confirming its exit of the structure. And so we see th a place like Groundhog Creek, a really, providing important crossings for bears currently, um, as are a place like the high bridge, this high spanning bridge that we're seeing elk and deer use. But mostly those crossings are few and far between. Um, and we see a lot of structures that aren't uh, being used by wildlife. So we see some potential to retrofit these existing structures to help safely cross, cross wildlife. Next slide. So I'm, I'm gonna pull all these things together, um, the research we found and how we use that, but just wanna get at and kind of wrapping up that and where we're going next. There are solutions to these problems that, that Tracy and Ben have laid out and, and we're getting at those through our research here. But those solutions in these areas where we identified as, as problem areas, you know, we can incorporate things like wildlife over and underpasses. Uh, that you see here in this picture. Or like I mentioned, retrofitting existing structures. So for example, in, in Virginia on Highway 64, they simply took a concrete box culvert used to pass um, vehicles, as well as a bridge used to pass vehicles and retrofitted those with guiding and exclusion fencing for wildlife, uh, mostly focused on deer. And those structures were then they, they reduce wildlife vehicle collisions in those areas by around 90%. And they had more use by wildlife by, by more than 100% prior to incorporating these. And so those are important tools that we can use um, to really reduce wildlife vehicle collisions and in, again, increase wildlife habitat connectivity. So next slide. And so just showing how we use the information we have here, you see the roadway is color coded by these 400 meter segments and, and the red there being uh, high wildlife vehicle collisions in those segments. Uh, we then have, you know, a photo corresponding with the structures there, whether wildlife are using them or not in those in those graphs and also where we have elk crossing the roadway. And so we're compiling all this information that helps us cite these mitigation opportunities. Um, and, and that's where we've moved from here with our collaborative process is using the, the information, working collaboratively together to highlight these most important areas and what could possibly be done there. So next slide. And, you know, as, as was highlighted earlier, um, Tracy mentioned, as we speak, a safe passage for wildlife is being installed along I-40 as part of uh, the North Carolina Department of Transportation bridge repair project. So that's at the Harmon Den exit, exit, and that's gonna be completed within a, a couple of months. And so because of our collaborative effort with our partners, working with the DOT, there's four other bridges that are slated to be replaced within our study area. And those two, uh, our group was able to give um, information on how the replacement of these bridges could really help uh, safe passage for wildlife and, and they've accepted those. And so we're looking for all of those uh, to be incorporated into the uh, other four bridge replacements. So next slide. And so looking at the big picture, uh, increasing highway permeability uh, in the Pigeon River Gorge will be a giant step towards improving animal population health, but this will represent only the first project in a series of much needed regional efforts. So the I-40 corridor could serve as a model 
uh, for other interstate highways that also disrupt uh, the southern and central Appalachian corridor that we know is so important. Uh, and they can see here, and we think about animals movement, moving to mitigate climate change. We see uh, you know, this bottleneck here in the southern Appalachians where wildlife are gonna be moving up the spine of the Appalachians. We wanna make sure connectivity for our wildlife species is, is a reality. And that's what this collaborative is working towards. So uh, finally, all in all, to create change, we all need to work together. Uh, and with our collaborative efforts here, uh, Safe Passage, you know, in along I-40 in the Pigeon River Gorge, this project is really working to make roads safer for both wildlife and people. Um, and this is how we're gonna get this done. And so uh, I'm gonna send it now back to Tracy uh, to tell us what y'all can do to help our efforts. Thank you, Liz. That was fantastic. And thank you so much for your efforts over the past few years to pull all of this information together. It's, it's remarkable and it's been fun to uh, watch the progress. Um, well, and I, I know, as you all know, it's a, it's a labor of love, so. Yes, it is, it's a labor of love. You know, and one of the questions I frequently get doing outreach is, you know, what can I do? What, what, what can I do to help? Is there anything that I can do? And sometimes these problems seem really big um, and it doesn't seem like there's much that we can do, but in fact, there is. And I just wanted to go over a few things that we can all do um, to help in this effort. Um, and I'm gonna start with some driving tips. I've been accused of uh, backseat driving uh, many times before, but this is one opportunity uh, I have to, uh, I've gotten permission to give some driving tips. So I'm gonna give some driving tips. Um, the first one is simply to slow down in areas where you see postings for deer, elk, and bear crossing or any animal crossings, particularly in wooded areas. Um, and especially in the early morning and late afternoon, early evening when animals are on the move. Um, I know this doesn't prevent uh, collisions from occurring, but wearing your seatbelt is gonna give you a better chance of avoiding or minimizing injuries if you hit a deer or other large animal on the road. Um, also, you wanna maintain a safe amount of distance between you and the car in front of you, especially at night, because if the vehicle in front of you has to stop quickly or hits a large animal, you could also be involved in the crash. Um, keep an eye out for wildlife in risky landscapes. Um, as Liz said, you know, a lot of these vehicle crashes occur where animals are more likely to travel, near bridges or overpasses, railroad tracks, streams, and ditches. So be vigilant um, when passing through these potentially risky areas. At night, if it's safe to do so, drive with your high beams and look on the side of the road for eyes reflecting in the headlights. Um, animals travel in groups, especially deer. So if you see one on this side of the road, be alert that others may be around as well. Um, if you see an animal near the road, slow down and blow your horn one long blast, okay? That should scare it off, keep it out of the road. Um, and if an animal is in the road, don't swerve to avoid the collision because you could lose control of your car. You could flip the car, you could veer into oncoming traffic um, or your overcorrecting um, could cause you to run off the road and cause a more serious crash. If you do hit a large animal or any animal and you stop and get out of the car, don't touch it. Um, a frightened or a wounded animal can be dangerous or it could further injure yourself. Um, best to get your vehicle off the road um, and call 911 if possible. So another thing that you can do to um, help is to visit the Safe Passage website and take the pledge. I'm gonna put the website here. So we have a pledge that we invite you to take. 
And it's a pledge to um, protect wildlife in the Pigeon River Gorge. We're looking to get 10,000 people to take the pledge. So far, we've got 302. And hopefully, after this presentation, we'll have another dozen. Um, and so the pledge is to simply observe the speed limit, be vigilant for wildlife entering the roadway, um, secure your food and trash in bear resistant containers. Um, as Liz said, you know, animals are on the move, particularly a bear if the acorn uh, crop is low, they're gonna be looking for food. Um, they can smell food up to a couple miles away. Um, and if they know that there's a trash source or outdoor food like dog food, if you feed your dog outside, um, they will become habituated and they're gonna cross roads to get to that area. So um, it's a good idea to secure your, secure your food and trash. And then also teach others about the importance of doing these things as well. Um, so you can pledge, fill out this form, and um, it also gives you an opportunity to join our email list, which is another way that you can help. Um, and if you join the email list, you'll get a newsletter that keeps you up to date on what's happening with the project. Um, other ways that you can get involved is to um, let your family and friends know about the problem and the solution. Um, and uh, teach others. Uh, you can share on social media, um, uh, posts that we do on Instagram or Facebook. Um, you can also uh, book a presentation if you are part of a civic group um, or club and you'd like to have a presentation, come to the website and fill out the form and uh, we'll provide you with someone to do a presentation either live or um, virtually. And yeah, I, um, I think that's it. Let me minimize this and say thank you so much for your attention, uh, for being here today. And I'm gonna open up the floor now for any questions that you have um, for Liz or Ben or I. Feel free to, you can use the chat. Uh, you can also unmute yourself and um, ask your question. And while we wait for questions, Ben, do you want to talk a little bit about the project that you are um, doing with the students? Yeah, happy to. Thank you, Tracy. Um, yeah. And, you know, please keep, the, keep those questions coming. But uh, one thing I wanted to share as part of this uh, project, we've been able to leverage a lot of exciting, innovative and, and, and uh, folks and strategies and talent to the cause. Um, one of our uh, partner groups, the Great Smokies Association, has a fantastic uh, author, uh, Frances Feigert, who does a lot of great work uh, for their newsletter and magazine. And she recently published a children's book um, called Search for Safe Passage, which is a really engaging book. It's uh, targeted for elementary age children. Uh, and it really tells a story from the perspective of some of these animals as they're approaching uh, and, and moving through the Pitcher River Gorge is, is a great way to sort of um, tell the story and explain the issue to a younger audience. Uh, the book also includes a field guide to some of the species that Liz and her research partners have encountered, as well as sort of a call to action of what young people can do to help raise awareness for this important issue as well. And so uh, we've brought that book um, and are providing copies to uh, school groups. Um, I'm actually working with the fourth grade class of Fernleaf Community Charter School here in the Asheville area. They're going to be reading the book uh, and then working in small groups to do some research on particular species and kind of what their needs are and how we can address and mitigate uh, safe passage. And also, they'll be taking part in some civic 
uh, activities, including advocacy to the North Carolina Department of Transportation, essentially uh, thanking them for the work they're already doing to integrate um, wildlife uh, uh, structures and fencing into the bridge replacement projects, but also encouraging them to do more. It's so important uh, that we align and have our uh, state agencies and um, political movers and shakers uh, doing all they can to support this effort. And so I'm very excited about that project. We also are hoping to leverage that ag advocacy into using social media via videos and poster presentations and other exciting ways to have those students get their voices heard. Uh, so that's a great project. If you are affiliated with a school group and would like a similar approach or something we can help you do, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to engage. But um, I do see a hand up from our colleague, uh, Elizabeth Fleming down in Florida, who's done amazing work on this issue for Florida Panthers in that state. Uh, so Elizabeth, did you have a question? Um, I have a comment that I, first of all, the work you're doing is just excellent and so glad to see this really take shape. And my comment is I don't think people realize the significance of roads on habitat and wildlife. You know, we've all heard about animals getting run over. Many people, you know, certainly we see it in our urban communities all the time, squirrels and possums and raccoons and stuff. But the interstate highway system in the United States has done more to transform the landscape across the entire country, probably than anything else has. So, you know, in Florida, we're seeing that so much with Florida Panthers being run over at high levels, losing to 20 to, to 30 a year is not sustainable for an endangered species. So it's just, I'm so glad to see um, this important work happening where you are and, and in other areas of the country. Um, and I, I, I just hope we can always emphasize that message that roads really open up places that wouldn't be accessible or they, they put wildlife directly on a collision course with humans traveling in our cars. So I'm just so glad to see the work that's progressing and encourage everyone to please spread the word. Thank you, Elizabeth. I also wanted to share with the group that right now is a very exciting time for all of us to be engaged and working to increase our voices to address this growing, uh, longstanding and growing uh, concern of, of wildlife vehicle uh, cause mortality. Um, we have a very unique opportunity now with the recent passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which for the first time has allocated um, significant financial resources uh, from the federal government to support states uh, in, in, as they deal with infrastructure needs, uh, shovel-ready projects, where I think the Pitt River Gorge is a fantastic candidate for investment. Uh, so it's really important that, you know, we're making those connections, uh, supporting, you know, politicians that are also working to provide funding uh, for these important programs because the issue is not going away and we need to make sure that we're addressing it and being proactive and that takes investment. Uh, and so I'm excited to see that opportunity. We've got a big uh, grant program that's emerging from the infrastructure bill uh, that'll be putting some of the projects like we have here in the River Gorge and elsewhere, like on Highway 64 for Red Wolves, places in Virginia near Great Dismal Swap and also in Florida where the, the needs for reducing vehicle mortality are also acute. Uh, so I just wanted to share that as well so that sometimes we need to understand that the responsibility we have is not just in our own behavior, but in also in helping to move the political needle forward uh, as we work to address these concerns. Um, but I see there's a question in the chat for Liz. And Liz, I think you've already attempted to answer it with a, a quick link. Uh, but the question was about when you guys are looking for technicians and volunteers, how, um, how you guys engage with folks. Yeah, um, so often it's on our website, but uh, me being here in North Carolina and involved with the, the North Carolina chapter of the Wildlife Society, uh, I often post to the membership board there too, but um, there is a, unfortunately, that jo the job that's currently on there that would be assisting me in, in doing some other projects that would be funded 
talk about in another capacity with Tracy and Ben. Um, you know, I do, we do, I do hire technicians for those, um, but that the project still on there has closed. It closed as of last week, but you will see wildlands opportunities there, but we do try to get out to the local uh, job boards and universities in, in North Carolina here. Yeah, and I would just encourage anyone interested in either the research or the advocacy side of this to go and, and take a look at the Safe Passage website. It's a great way to plug in and get involved. Uh, it's not something that's going to result in a lot of spam, but really just kind of keeping you informed um, of this issue. And I'm just so excited that we have a chance to share the amazing progress that's been made to date. And I want to recognize that none of that progress would be uh, possible without the support of people like you uh, supporting organizations like ours and then our organizations working together in a collaborative capacity with partner groups, tribes, federal and state agencies. So it really does, you know, to kind of uh, borrow a, a poor cliche, it does take a village to do this. Uh, you know, conservation work is challenging. It takes a, a huge Herculean effort by many, many people uh, devoting their time and treasure to making sure this can occur uh, and, and, and staying vigilant on these issues. So we really do appreciate that support and all the help that you provide to make that possible. Are there any other questions? If not, I'm gonna launch the final poll and it's just it's simply a take action poll. Um, are you willing to take any of the following actions? You can check them all if you want, you can check one. Um, we'd love it if you would take the pledge, follow the driving tips, spread the word, share on uh, social media, um, sign up for our newsletter and uh, educate your group. Cool. That's great. Yeah, it looks like just about everybody is um, willing to do something and every little bit helps. So um, thank you all for being here today. Again, we'll have a recording. We'll get that out to you with um, some of these action items. You'll get that by email. And we uh, welcome you to share that far and wide with anybody you think uh, would be interested in knowing about this. Uh, problem and solution. So thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your week, folks.